Hello and welcome. My name is Timothy Parker. I'm the District 2 engineer for Southeastern New Mexico. And thank you for watching and attending today regarding uh, the NMDOT's Human Trafficking Awareness Initiative. And the Human Trafficking Awareness Initiative came about for several different reasons. I'm currently serving on a Attorney General's task force regarding the issue. And so I represent the department um, in that when we have committee meetings once a quarter. Uh, et cetera, to kind of have a statewide focus, to be able to represent our part of the state, but as well represent uh, the NMDOT on that task force, which is law enforcement and other groups that are trying to tackle this real sensitive and important issue. Um, I'm also the statewide and district chair for Rotary International's District 5520 Human Trafficking Awareness Initiative, which covers the entire state of New Mexico and southwest Texas from uh, Fort Stockton, Presidio, all the way over to El Paso. And so one of the things that uh, I wanted to share with you was how did I get involved with this? You know, I, we're usually busy building roads. We're usually busy maintaining roads, uh, keeping uh, active in, in many ways uh, for safety. But it was about, I guess, August of 2017, I had a friend who's a CDL driver, an over-the-road truck driver, send me some pictures, and I'm going to share a couple of them with you here in a minute. And he shared uh, a picture with me, and he, and he said, um, and he sent it to my state email. And uh, he asked me, what do I do with this? And this is uh, what he sent me. And so this young lady here is 14 years old. She's from Mexico. She speaks no English. And he found her on a road between Carlsbad and Jell, wearing what she's wearing at 2 in the morning. Something's not right with that, would you say? And so that's kind of how he felt. And so uh, he took this, in, in, he, he speaks Spanish, so he took her to the local law enforcement, and uh, they had a big discussion. And, uh, you know, that was the first picture he sent me. And I, I forwarded that on to New Mexico State Police. But then he came across this. One of his buddies sent him this. And then another buddy made this, because sometimes you have to sit and wait. When you're in the frac sand business, you have to sit and wait. And uh, so they made a meme. And, but no important is that what's going on here. And it's happening in our right of way. And it's, you know, who do you report this to? Who do you share this information with? And he shared it with me. So I shared it with New Mexico State Police. And then I went to a friend of mine who's a physician. He has a practice here in the area. And I was sharing with him these pictures and telling him this is, uh, you know, first it's kind of messed up. And then you've got um, some other things. And he shared that, uh, if, Tim, if you think that's bad, we've got high school age kids going down making a buck, $500 in a night, coming back up with STDs back to Roswell, back to high school so they can pay for their new Mustang. You know, some, I mean, I have a daughter. I have a son. That hit me really hard. And so I went and shared some friends in Dallas. And these friends in Dallas, uh, uh, one of them, uh, they introduced me to this uh, husband and wife who own all the Dickies barbecues. Everybody knows Dickies barbecues. They introduced me to Ms. Maureen Dickey. And she introduced me to, they have a foundation. And they do a lot of human trafficking training. And so she introduced me to these, uh, this husband wife team. He was in the Dallas Police Department for 30 years. And she works in the genetic side at University of North Texas. So he is, is very intimately involved with uh, prostitution in the Dallas area, human trafficking in that area. And then she's the one that works on the DNA samples of the offenders, uh, the alleged perpetrators, as well as the victims, and adds it to a national data, DNA database to try and track these things. And uh, their names are Lewis and Martha Fellini. And so they're the ones that ultimately put this presentation together for me. I've modified it a little bit. I've given it many, many times around the state. Um, but I want to share it with y'all because every day you have an opportunity to do something about this. It might not be if, uh, but it will be when. You're going to see something that just doesn't look right. And so I'm going to share with you uh, some background. I'm going to go into some really tough stuff. Stuff that I initially, when I talked about it, you know, I, you know, when you're bald and you get embarrassed, you turn red all the way back. You know, some of this stuff was really hard to talk about the first several times 
but it doesn't get any easier, especially if you have kids, grandkids, or if you know uh, people that are under 18 that you care about. Um, these are somebody's kids. And so that's what we're going to be talking about here today. And, and, and at the very end of our presentation this, uh, today, I'll share with you what you can do about it, you as an individual NMDOT employee. We all went in, and it was me and my cousin Chrissy and my cousin Cody. We went in and asked my mom if we could go down and get some Frosties before dinner. Um, and she said, yeah. Me and Chrissy's walking, and that's when the Lincoln pulled up. From the very, very beginning, they drilled it into my head, they drilled it into her head that, you know, if we try to act up, something really bad was going to happen. He threw me into the dining room table, busted me up pretty good, um, but Chrissy, he dragged up the stairs by her hair, threw her down the stairs, and did it again like three more times. I didn't want to end up dead, I didn't want her dead, and it be my fault, you know, I mean, it's like... They had us completely wrapped, completely controlled, you know, to where we were brainwashed, to where we were like, okay, we have to do this or else, you know, something bad could happen. I mean, that's what they did. They just played us off each other, you know, and it worked. Here we are, you know, I'm 15 years old, my cousin is 14, and we're here at a truck stop, you know, being forced to work it, you know, being forced to go to, from truck to truck, asking, you know, if the guy would like to have sex with us, you know, and we're young girls, terrified out of our minds. That truck driver um, paid for um, sexual acts with me, um, so I had to do that with another guy that I didn't even know. It was just an awful experience how many truck drivers, you know, was okay with it, um, you know, not thinking that, you know, this is somebody's daughter, you know, this is somebody's family member, you know, that it is missed, you know, you don't think of that that they don't want to be here. Thank God what saved me was that truck driver that did think that, you know, that called in and said, hey, you know, this is whoever at the TA truck stop, you know, and we have some girls out here that look pretty young. Oh, that truck hurt. <laughs> the one that made that phone call, I, I think about him all the time. I have never met him. I don't know who he is, but... Boy, I owe him a lot. <laughs> if it wasn't for him calling the police and saying that she just doesn't look right there, I have no idea what what would have happened. I'm just, I'm so, I'm, boy, am I thankful to him, to that truck driver. God, am I thankful to him. And if, he's, if he ever sees us, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So many of you remember in the news about eight weeks ago, there was something that made statewide news uh, just south of Roswell, just uh, a few short miles south of here. Uh, Sheriff Mike Harrington came uh, and shared the story with us, uh, with a community service group I'm a part of. And there were 70, well the first thing when they pulled up on the site, it was because uh, a concerned citizen saw something and they said something, which is a big emphasis point that I wanted to share with you today. Somebody saw something and they said something, so law enforcement went and checked it out. And when you see hundreds and hundreds of shoes in the middle of a yard, a fenced yard, and a 20 by 30 shed, inside this 20 by 30, well first they noticed the shoes and that was kind of wrong. But then they get over to this 20 by 30 shed and there's 70, 17 to 22 year olds around that age group 
in this 70 by 30 shed. Boys, girls, boys were used during the day for labor trafficking and the ladies uh, at night for other things. And so that was in our backyard here in Roswell. Some of y'all remember just last week, somebody reported something on one of their neighbors and they went in and it was a, a safe house for human trafficking, seven, uh, I don't know if it was Honduran or Guatemalan immigrants, right here in Roswell, because a neighbor reported that there was something amiss. See something, you say something. And so we, we're in the transportation business, and we know a road network. We know the roads that we serve in the districts and the uh, patrols that we serve. And so this is taking a look at the present day USDOT road network. Uh, the bigger the red bar, the bigger the volume of trucks. 2035. Present, 2035. So anywhere you see heavy truck traffic, anywhere you see heavy industry, heavy commerce, so goes human trafficking and labor trafficking. What do we have here in southeastern New Mexico? Has oil and gas taken off? Have we got a big impact and people come in from all over the nation to work? generally in two to three counties, all in our district, in this part of the state, southeastern New Mexico. I mean, it's, they, they've got their issues in Las Cruces, and there's stories I can show, tell you there. Albuquerque, Santa Fe, any population center, anywhere along the border, but anywhere there is freight and truck traffic and truckers, man camps. So they've got 70,000 water meters in the Carlsbad area right now. That's supposed to be a town of 35, 45,000 people, but they have 70 water meters online right now uh, that the city of Carlsbad is serving. So there's a ton of folks down there. We know that. But what this graph represents is the issue isn't going to go away. Oil and gas is going to be here for decades. They're making investments that are going to be here 20, 30 years. And so this is something we have to address, and this is another opportunity that we have. So something that this Dallas, I share with this, this is Dallas, but this is something that we have as an issue as well as an opportunity is continuity of care. So this, it was basically a grassroots effort to try and deal with their situation. They didn't wait for the situation, somebody to get arrested and then do something. They actually went out to the streets and set up uh, a mobile uh, police station. And I'm going to share with you a little bit about that here in a minute. But they had to change the law, they had to create a nonprofit because what do you do when you take these people off the streets. If they're a minor, where do we put these kids? We put them in CYFD. What programs do we take to take care of them to make sure that they are safe, that they are okay? What about the adults that are caught up in it? How do we get them a traditional job? How do we get them training in the workforce? It's called continuity of care. There's a hard, you know, we, we make a change in somebody's life and take them out of one situation, but then where do we put them to? And that's an issue, that's like $2 um, of fees. Thanks, Brett. Um, so they had to create a nonprofit. It's also been duplicated in Phoenix, and this is something the state of New Mexico has an opportunity to improve on. In Dallas, Texas, a new program is changing lives. It's called the Prostitute Diversion Initiative. The initiative's goal? To get prostitutes off the streets and give them a chance at a new life. The Prostitute Diversion Initiative is a program in which law enforcement is undergoing a philosophical change. Rather than approaching this population as criminals, we intend to approach them as victims. In Dallas, Texas, more than 1,000 prostitutes work five truck stops. When you start getting victimized and you start getting addicted to drugs, and that's what leads you to turn to crime. Nobody in their right mind wants to be a prostitute. Every 24 hours, more than 10,000 trucks visit these truck stops. Some drivers bring major crime with them, and some come here to kill. According to the FBI's Highway Serial Killer Initiative, more than 200 serial killers working as truck drivers prey on prostitutes. Once a month, covert, uniformed, and vice officers of the Dallas PDI program arrest women working the stops and the surrounding neighborhoods. What help do you need? I just need a missile. Need a best friend to call? You know what? That's the perfect place right here where we're going. Once arrested, the women go directly to a mobile PDI command center. 
here, they are met by a special team, which offers the women help. You have probation, you have a community court, you have a criminal court, you have the health department, and you have the you know social service triage folks. Judges in mobile courtrooms meet with each woman and give them a choice, jail or rehab. There have been nights that I have sat there and I have cried with a defendant after she has given me her story. But after all is said and done, wipe my tears away and I'm like, okay, let's get to business. What can we do to stop this cycle? Some will choose jail, but for those who choose rehab, help begins immediately. Homeward Bound is a rehab facility dedicated to helping women get off drugs and out of prostitution. We want to help them with the mental health and substance abuse. We want to help them with the physical health, specifically STDs. And we want to have a path for them, you know, to, to exit. Our patients are probably the most versatile, unbelievable women you can possibly meet. Me personally, I don't want to be a prostitute, but I see my mother do drugs. I see my mother be a prostitute. I've been a call girl. I've slept with men for money. I, for a long time, I felt really ashamed. So here, I've gotten that out. For me, that's, that's like a new future, you know? If a woman makes it through the first intensive 45 days of the rehab program, she's got a fighting chance. For Jamie Wolf, rehab turned her life around. If there would have been nobody there showing me a different way to live, then I wouldn't be here. And uh, I'm certainly a pay it forward kind of lady. Together, the Dallas police and the staff at Homeward Bound are working to bring women back from the brink and give them hope. Every day I wake up, I tell myself I'm beautiful, I'm worth living, and I'm going to become something in my life. So that's the opportunity we have is that continuity of care. If we're going to take people off the street, we need to have a place to put them and they have to want to be there. You know, it's uh, a, a unique challenge, especially when, you know, in a regional setting in New Mexico, these type of services that you would see maybe in Albuquerque or Las Cruces or maybe Santa Fe, we may or may not have in this part of the state. And so that's a, a much bigger picture issue, but my goal is to expose y'all to the information and then you can decide uh, how to take it from there. Something that goes along with prostitution, human trafficking, labor trafficking is an impact on your health. Um, impact on your health. Uh, one of the things that uh, some of these groups do is they test for different types of cancers. Uh, ladies uh, can acquire many diseases uh, working the streets or being prostituted out. And so uh, in this group of 1,172 participants in this one study, 100% um, involved some type of drug use. Uh, some, 57%, more than half, had some type of trauma, abuse, 83% were smokers, and 55% had at least 50 plus sex partners. And that's why treating in healthcare is very important very early on when someone is taken out of that type of situation is they need to have healthcare. You know, it could be dental work, cavities, it's not like, you know, that se those 70 kids that they found in that 20 by 30 shed south of here, it's not like they were brushing their teeth every night. And in fact, I think uh, Sergeant Herring I'm a Sheriff Harrington said that uh, most of them had some type of chlamydia cream or some something because of STDs. And so, you know, there's a lot of healthcare issues that come with tackling this. So what is human trafficking? You know, that is a question, how does it really work? Well, it involves an action, a means, and a purpose to those means. Actions would be recruiting, harboring, like what was happening south of here, transporting, you know, the board, our Border Patrol, you know, have kind of left our inspection stations. Everybody's working on what's happening down on the border right now. Um, so there is tra uh, transporting, you know, we're seeing that up well farther than Roswell. Uh, providing, obtaining, patronizing, soliciting, advertising, and that's involving sex trafficking. And then the means, keep in mind, anybody who's a minor, whether it's their own free will, like some of the high school kids I mentioned earlier, whether it's their own free will or not, it's still human trafficking because they're a minor, they're under 18. 
and uh, there's uh, severe penalties for that. Minors induced into commercial sex are human trafficking victims regardless if forced, fraud, or, or coercion is present, or if they're a willing participant. Force, fraud, coercion are the means. And then the purpose, obviously, commercial sexual exploitation, exploitation or forced labor. You know, besides oil and gas, southeastern New Mexico is big in agriculture. And so seeing labor trafficking, I know that doesn't surprise many of us, but some people don't want to think about that. But it's part of human trafficking. If these folks, you know, the, those young men who were in that 20 by 30 shed were being used as day laborers, and that's, that's a huge issue and a huge problem. And that's where I go back to, if you see something, you say something. And it's all over nationally. It's not just, you know, here. It's nationwide. And there's articles that, from all over, including southeastern New Mexico, including the southwest, west of the Mississippi, east of the Mississippi, interstate traffic, people leaving here. If the temperature gets turned up because some of the neighbors are kind of saying some things, you know, they go to another state. They move people. They have a whole network nationally of being able to uh, move people around. And here in a few slides, it'll talk about the business aspect of it. And this is a lot of New Mexico right here. So it is one of the most underreported statistics that are out there regarding human trafficking. You know, if you think our traffic data is bad, trying to get stuff, you know, the most current traffic data we have today in June of 2019 is from 2017. Have things changed, have things changed on our road in two years? I mean, the whole, the whole human trafficking issue is grossly underreported. And so, like, maybe uh, just a few percent of what's really going on out here uh, this one study from a few 2017 statistics from the National Hotline, 10,615 individual victims, 8,759 cases. You have victims, and then how many of them actually turn into cases? And then 4,863 potential traffickers, and they're usually not just trafficking one person. But this is kind of the scary thing as well, is trafficking businesses an actual identified business, almost 1,700 businesses, and that's underreported. So that's, uh, there is no official estimate of the total number of human trafficking victims in the U.S. We estimate it reaches into the hundreds of thousands when estimates of both uh, adults and minors and sex trafficking and la uh, labor trafficking are all combined together. And then you see the intensity graph here from 2017. I argue that you see a little dot down there in southeastern New Mexico that's red. What are some risk factors? You know, you think about how does this happen to people? Uh, there's societal issues, uh, lack of awareness, um, that commercial exploitation can occur, uh, lack of resources. You know, I need food. I need money for this new Mustang. I need this. I need that. Lack of resources. And then community risk factors, peer pressure. You know, I, I, once again, I frame this in the mind of my children, in their school, in the stories they come and share with me uh, about the Artesia School District, you know, all of our schools uh, have similar issues. And so, you know, peer pressure, social norms, social isolation, uh, social media. You know, how many kids are getting hit on uh, through social media, whatever games they're playing. You know, I walked in one time and my daughter was playing this Roblox game. And there were these people on there saying things, and we had to modify her playing that game because, I mean, they're using these children's chat rooms to attract young kids, especially when they're uh, in their formative stages. Um, there can be some gang involvement, that's for sure. Uh, Under-resourced schools, neighborhoods, communities, and then family, conflict in the family. You know, there is no perfect family, and so I'm going to say that right now. And so, you know, if somebody's had something bad happen in their family, I'm sorry. But family conflict, disruption, dysfunction, that can point kids in a different direction. And, you know, some, I've seen some videos where, you know, you know, back in the day we would call them pimps. Uh, most of them today are business people, and they all are some of the slickest salesmen uh, and, and ladies. Uh, because sometimes ladies are the, the, the business person involved with that. And they can convince people. And uh, there will be a video on that here in a second. And so 
uh, individual risk factors, history of child abuse, neglect, um, maltreatment, homelessness. You know, in Albuquerque, in Albuquerque Public Schools, there's over 10,000 students that are homeless. Where do they live? A lot of them live in the cars outside of the school, and then the parent sends them into the school for Head Start, and then they go try and work. And I've met some of these people when I was up there. Um, 10,000 kids that uh, don't have a home in Albuquerque public schools alone. Um, <clears throat> homelessness, runaways, folks in the LGBT community uh, can be targets. Uh, history of systems involved, uh, the juvenile justice system, CYFD, criminal justice, foster care, and then stigma and discrimination. I mean, this is heavy stuff, and I apologize for sharing it with you in this way, but it is. And it needs to be, the information has to get out. And that's where you all can make a difference where you're seated here today. And who are some of these victims? We all know it's children and adults. There are adults that are in that. Girls and women are disproportionately affected. Drugs, low self-esteem, um, immature, naive, thinks they know everything. Uh, vulnerable populations, those that have child abuse, homelessness, unstable homes, runaways, and the list goes on and on. And then I talked about, you know, being a real slick salesman. It's grooming. It's called grooming. I, I meet you at the mall. You know, I, there's a slide here in a minute where, you know, they talk about, you know, where do you meet? Well, the friendly stranger was in this one study of 941 uh, human trafficking victims, a friendly stranger. I see him at the mall when I'm out at the mall every Saturday. He was really cool or she was really cool. And over the time, over the course of several months, you develop a relationship with somebody, you know, whether it's, Wherever you go, you know, you, you meet somebody new, and there is a process to getting to know somebody. These people are experts at that. Uh, it was a friend, 14.6% that got people involved uh, to a sex uh, trafficker. Uh, only 7.8% was a complete stranger, and it's really sad, but it's true, 3.1% was a family member. They were pimping out their own kids or their own family member in that way. Um, how does the most of it take place because of physical violence without weapons was 66.5%. Um, the next two highest were psychological, sexual violence, physical violence. You know, technology was majority of the time using social media, using some other type of site to get and attract uh, these people. Um, and I'm going to share some, something that is really rough to say. The youngest person in this study was four years old. And that was part of the grooming process. This young child was being groomed, uh, basically sold at, uh, I think, two years of age to a trafficker. And then they raised them up. And they raised them up. Uh, and it goes from there. And the oldest was 73. Why? Because she needed some money. So there you go. It uh, affects all age groups. It's not just 18 and under, but equally as important. Ton of health problems, physical injuries, chronic diseases. Uh, I mentioned the poor dental hygiene, dehydration, eating disorders, branding, migraines. I share all this because this is the stuff that's important to recognize when you're out in the field and you see something. To say something, you kind of need to be able to differentiate between uh, grandma and, uh, and her granddaughter or grandpa and his granddaughter in a situation. Do you see somebody that has or looks like they have some of these issues? Dehydration too skinny, really, really, really exceptionally dirty clothes, branding. Most of them are branded or they have a tattoo with a, uh, a barcode like we get sometimes in prisons. Um, they have reproductive issues. You know, the healthcare providers have a big part in this. And I'll share with you a video here in a second on uh, what a healthcare provider had to share. And then anxiety, PTSD, depression, shame, dissociative disorders, you know, the list goes on and on of the type of health problems that people that have been trafficked, even labor traffic, uh, have involved. 88% of survivors reported having had contact with the healthcare system, meaning they go to a doctor and the doctor, all right, so you're 12 years old and you've got an STD, you did something wrong. But the physicians haven't necessarily, and this is coming from physicians who told me this, they haven't necessarily been trained to ask the right questions to discern why would a 12-year-old, why would a 10-year-old have this? And how, you know, putting two and two together, you know, ans asking the right questions. And that's an issue as well.
Most people, even today, think that trafficking and exploitation happens in third world countries, not in the United States of America and certainly not in Kentucky, but it does, and I'm proof that it does. I grew up in a town in Kentucky and I, in a middle class home, I have an older sister and um, my parents divorced in my late teens. I was an avid swimmer. Um, it was my life and, and something I enjoyed doing. It was a passion of mine. Um, and I always enjoyed art from the time that I was very young. Art class was my favorite subject in school. I was trafficked beginning as a very young child. Uh, it was pretty much almost a part of my life, um, all of my life, up until I escaped when I was 18. My trafficker was somebody that had my complete trust and the complete trust of my family, and therefore it made it very easy to gain access to me, to exploit me. There were quite a few moments in time when I was trafficked that, you know, the opportunity for intervention arose. When I was a young child, I had chronic reoccurring vaginal infections that was treated my, by my pediatrician. Then in middle school, um, I contracted a oral sexually transmitted disease um, in which I was treated by an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Both physicians were wonderful and very caring, um, but not one physician or healthcare worker ever asked whether I was being sexually exploited, not once. Both doctors knew my family, and so I think that they may have dismissed that, thinking no way could a child from a middle-class home be being exploited. Another case where I see an opportunity that was missed for an intervention was um, I was in middle school. Somebody reported that I was being sexually abused. I had to go down to Child Protective Services. Prior to going to my interview, I was coached by my trafficker on what to say and how to deny the abuse. He told me not to talk too much and to know that the CPS was not my friend. I distinctively remember him saying, do you know what they want to do? And I said, no. And he said that they want to take you away if you say anything for good. You'll be locked up, taken away from your family, your friends, and your pets. You will go to jail, and everybody will know what you did. By the time I got there and walking into the office, in which I was interviewed by a CPS worker. I walked in there feeling guilty, feeling ashamed, and not at all seeing the social worker who was interviewing me as somebody that could help me, who was there to rescue me and bring me to safety. I saw her as the enemy, and I answered her questions, denying that I was being abused, and left there. Um, with no, there was no follow-up, and I left, and my con trafficking continued. What led me to being an advocate today is, one, receiving long-term extensive therapy to get me to a place where I'm confident in who I am and that I know that nothing that was done to me was my fault. The second most important thing that led me to be coming an advocate is meeting other survivor leaders. What I would say to a victim just coming out from their exploitation, from their trafficking situation, is that I'm so sorry this happened to you. I know you're scared and unsure of your future. I want you to know that what happened to you was not your fault. 
that you do not have to let it define you, that you are more than who you think you are at the moment, that you can rise above your oppression, you can achieve your goals and reach your dreams, and you don't have to do it alone. You have a family of survivors, of your brothers and sisters, to be there with you as you move forward. It's important to me to be an advocate because I really strongly feel that we need survivor leaders in the movement against trafficking. Our voices are vital, valuable, and very important. I really feel that we have to come together as allies to really help end modern slavery. I am counteracting the injustice that was done to me. And there's a lot of barriers, I guess, in a, a lady situation like that. And a lot of it comes back to educating the providers, the healthcare providers. Lack of knowledge or training to ask the right questions, to drill down. Uh, lack of adequate understanding of laws. People get very uh, fearful when they say HIPAA. Uh, misidentification of cases. You know, what if you accuse somebody incorrectly? And I'll talk about that at the very end of our presentation. Talk about um, how do we say something. Um, pre uh, prejudicial attitudes, access to neutral interpreters. You know, a lot of our healthcare providers don't speak Spanish. And so that can create an issue. And how do you convey something? And how do you pick something up? Um, uh, so the healthcare system has an opportunity as well. Um, a lot of societies are trying to train. A lot of medical schools are kind of trained. But we're still not there yet. Um, in identifying a human trafficking victim, we're going to talk about that at the very, very end with a video that will kind of help close it out. But it involves stopping and observing asking and responding, and there's a time and place for everything. We never want to just confront some of these traffickers because a lot of them are carrying weapons or something else you really don't want to deal with. And at the very end of our time today, I'll talk about what our process is as a district, and we're evaluating as a department uh, to uh, how do you do something? How do you, how do you do the appropriate getting the information out? Because confronting is the last thing you want to do to a lot of these things. You want to become aware of the scope of human trafficking, which is why we're here today to learn a little bit about it, but also observe. Recognize verbal and nonverbal indicators of potential human trafficking victims. Why would a grandfather or a dad you know, do or act a certain way as you're sitting in your truck at work and you're watching something over there in the distance and you know how you would handle you know, your child, why would this situation be any different? Sometimes it looks like an abuse case, sometimes it doesn't. And so there's a lot of things that you just have to be observant about and then you have to ask if there's an opportunity, if you're walking you know, out of the restroom or out in a hotel, you know, many of you are on per diem. A lot of trafficking occurs in hotels. In fact, there's an app I have on my phone that you take four pictures inside your hotel room and it goes to a national database and they're able to identify has a human trafficking victim been in this hotel chain because of the way you know, every hotel is furnished differently. And so they're able to dial it in and, and, and that's a huge help. Um, asking the right questions, responding, uh, act effectively. You know, if someone, what if someone came up to you? I have a friend who's a over-the-road truck driver, CDL guy, nationally. He was at a truck stop one night, and he's loyal to his wife. And a girl came uh, running up and asked for help. How would you handle that? What would you do if someone uh, came up and asked, you know, for you to help? Or like my friend who uh, uh, found that girl at 2 in the morning, how would you act? Would you do it any differently? Something to think about. When you work in the service industry, you see a lot of homes in all sorts of areas. Meet a lot of people and even pets. Out here, you have to take your job seriously and always be on the lookout to find better ways to safeguard the people you serve. What kind of shop are you guys going on here? Tool and die shop. Great, welcome to the neighborhood. Thanks. 
or the products that protect their homes, or services to get their homes running just right. You work hard every day because you don't want to miss a thing. Like you just did. Do I have your attention? Workers who are in people's homes on a day-to-day -day basis are a critical part of identifying potential cases of human trafficking and combating this horrific crime. to look for, you can help bring an end to human trafficking. As service workers, you play an important role in the detection of human trafficking. You are on the front lines, in homes and in neighborhoods. Now that you know some of the signs to look for, you can help save those who are being victimized. Together, we can make a difference. If you identify someone you think may need help, please contact the National Human Trafficking Resource Center at 888-373-7888. This is a toll-free hotline that's available to answer calls from anywhere in the country, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and all calls are confidential. On behalf of the Michigan State Police, thank you for your help in keeping our community safe. And that was produced by the Michigan Department of Transportation, I believe, and we're working at doing something similar uh, with uh, more New Mexico style homes and things like that. But that's, that video right there really kind of what brought everything home for me because you think about every day we're out in the public in our areas that we serve and the communities that we serve and we see, we see a lot of things. Um, and so that's kind of the opportunity that we have I think is that when you see something, you say something. As an NMDOT employee in District 2, uh, I think it's your obligation. If you see something, you say something. Uh, if you don't know that you're seeing what you think you're seeing, then do not engage, but I want you to document everything. I want you to document the make, model, the license plate on that car, if you can see the license plate. If you have a camera phone, take pictures. Documentation helps a whole bunch. Was it a blue Toyota? Or was it a blue Nissan? Uh, what did the guy or the lady look like? What were they wearing? What was their appearance? How tall were they? Are you close enough to make out any distinguishing marks? How about the alleged victim? Where are they? How were they dressed? How did they act? How did they appear? Was some, what wasn't right to you? What in your gut? I mean, you've got a gut. You know when something isn't right. What wasn't right to you about that situation? Document it. Write it in your logbook. Write it on a piece of paper. Uh, take pictures if you have a camera phone. But document, document, document. I know some of y'all have issues documenting other things when it comes to our, our job, but I really highly encourage you and put some urgency on it to document the best you can when it comes to a situation that you're not sure about. Because your gut, your knower will know. Something just doesn't look right. And then especially if you can get a license plate and uh, do not chase somebody down to get their license plate. Do not engage. I come back to that. But you got to report it. You need to notify your supervisor who's going to notify me and then I'm going to notify the folks that I do. But I also, everybody in this room generally works with law enforcement at some time or another. Uh, you know someone on the local uh, county sheriff, local uh, police officer or maybe even that state police officer, you need to, after you notify your supervisor, notify law enforcement, because time is of the essence in these things. You know, uh, we're gonna talk about calling the hotline on the next slide, but that could take, it's a national hotline and it's not in New Mexico. You know, the truckers against trafficking, I could send them an email with some stuff and three days later, you know, these people are already in Florida. Time is of the essence on these things, and so we have to get local law enforcement involved to say, I think there could be a human trafficking situation going on. And so notify law enforcement, but also notify the national hotline because they're the ones that keep statistics. State by state statistics 
on the human trafficking situation. In fact, if you went out to humantraffickinghotline.org, and I encourage you to do that, to see what is New Mexico like over the last couple of years. Why was 2017 so much more than 2018? What's happening here? What's happening there? It actually breaks a lot of statistics down about the state of New Mexico on the National Human Trafficking Hotline, 888-373-7888. And so we have to, if we see something, we got to say something. And so that's the goal of today is to raise your awareness. That's why we're doing it as a district and the department is evaluating it. That's why we're recording it here today because it's going to roll out potentially to every DOT employee because it's that important. And it's happening statewide. There's not a corner of New Mexico that this, is, this issue is not happening. And we've got, what, 332 employees in District 2, well over 2,500 in the department as a whole. That's a lot of eyes, that's a lot of ears, and that's a lot of opportunity to make some wrongs right. And that's where I hope you'll take and consider, you know, when you see something, that you say something.